Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the state of American journalism with investigative reporter Cy Hirsch. I still want to see, I want somebody to tell, tell the American people how much money um, corporate America is making uh, with the new tax legislation. Well, Warren Buffett said the other day, the milk multi-billionaire, he saved $574 million last year in the tax bill. I don't think the American people really quite get it, how he's rammed it right up then, this new bill. Seymour Hirsch is perhaps the nation's greatest investigative reporter. He has since winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1970 for his uncovering of the slaughter by U.S. troops of more than 500 Vietnamese civilians in the village of My Lai on March 16, 1968. Gone on to break one seismic story after another. He exposed the Nixon administration's secret bombing of Cambodia, the CIA's domestic spying operation against anti-war activists and its role in the overthrow in 1973 of the Chilean government of Salvador Allende. More recently, he broke the story about the torture of prisoners by U.S. soldiers in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq and exposed the fictitious narrative the Obama administration spun around the killing of Osama bin Laden. Is this era of great journalism, which he embodies, however gone, in an age when, as he writes, we are sodden with fake news, hyped up and incomplete information and false assertions delivered nonstop by our daily newspapers, our televisions, our online news agencies, our social media, and our president. Joining me in the studio to discuss his new book, Reporter, a Memoir in the State of American Journalism, is Cy Hirsch. I love the book. I I'm a report. You know, I worked some of the places you did. I, I devoured this thing in one day. Um, but I want to begin, because throughout the book, there's, I find it very poignant, and it's something we've all done as reporters. It's what we can't tell. Um, and um, you, you begin very early, you're covering uh, Chicago police. And you write, the driver, white, beefy, and very Irish, like far too many Chicago cops then, obviously did not see me as he parked the car. As he climbed out, a fellow cop who clearly had heard the same radio report I had shouted something. So the guy tried to run on you. The driver said, no, nah, I told to beat it and then plugged him. He shot him dead. But that didn't get in your story. <sighs> and, and, and there are moments like that. We've all had it. Um, and, and you put it in the book. I mean, you're quite open about this form of self-censorship, but let's begin with that. Uh, I was covering, I'm a kid. I, um, uh, I grew up in, in, I was an immigrant, um, which apparently isn't such a good thing to be these days no. in this country. But anyway, my parents both came over from Eastern Europe. Uh, I had a father that didn't talk and a mother that communicated by cooking. So, uh, you know, I was on my own. Uh, although they were perfectly, you know, they were perfectly, they took care of me and my, my, my siblings. Uh, Can so, I just interject that you worked your way through the University of Chicago running your father's cleaning? My father or, died, got right. cancer when I was 15, and I took over because I was, I had a brother, but he was always more ethereal, and um, uh, I was the one who could cope, so, uh, or at least it was seemed that way. And so I ran it, and um, uh, I got to the University of Chicago by hook and crook and had a good education, but um, never was free, really, of the family constraints until um, I graduated from college when my brother, my twin brother, uh, took my mother. I, I took care of her for five years, took my mother to California with him. He, he got married. And I was suddenly free, free of the, of the burden of opening up a store. It was in the black ghetto of Chicago. I learned an awful lot about racism just by being part of it and uh, seeing it firsthand. I, you know, my, the people that worked for us um, would talk about uh, the constrained future they had. Anyway, um, I go to law school, I hate law school, I drop out, I'm still free. I mean, I'm paying 12 bucks a week for a basement room, and I've never felt so happy. I'm reading all the stuff that I could do. And um, I drop out, and I'm selling booze, and one day um, in a bar, somebody who's just going to work for Time Magazine told me about a place called City News Bureau. It's a police agency. Chicago had so much crime and uh, so much court action since the John Dillinger days of, you know, of street crime in, in Chicago, the massacres, St. Valentine's, famous massacres of, the, of organized crime. So the four papers got together in the 1920s and set up a news agency that, whose function would be to cover the courts and the police station. So I went there as a copy boy. I got a job by sheer luck. You just had to go on a, uh, you had to have a BA. <laughs> and they just went through, anyway, I got there. I run a copy machine. 
um, I get sent finally to be a reporter on the street. I get a sense of it by running, being a copy boy, I get a sense of what it's like. But within months, I'm covering downtown Chicago police. I'm the midnight, they called it the lobster ship shift. And I'm, I'm doing three reporters, somebody from the Chicago Tribune, and I'm there representing the other papers and the, new, and the radio stations. And most nights from midnight to eight, nothing happens. And the cops, you know, cops are pretty friendly guys. They come back and if they make a big bust with some marijuana, we smoke it with them or watch a dirty movie with them and stuff like that. This is 1960. And um, uh, I learned a lot about the police. I learned a lot about tyranny because the one thing you could do as a reporter in Chicago, as a police reporter, is the cops will be real good to you if you don't do two things, mess around with their corruption or the mob. They protected the mob. I'm exaggerating slightly, but you'd have a situation where some guy in, in, in the, there's a, a, a street of sin that the mob controlled, you know, brothels and stuff like that. If some guy showed up and, on the street with 14 bullet holes in it and it was reported as a victim of a traffic accident, you didn't mess with that. Right. But other than that, you owned the city. <laughs> and so one night, about three o'clock, this cop calls in and says, uh, I've got a fugitive that tried to flee and I, uh, I had to take, you know, he's dead, I had to shoot him. And so instead of waiting for him to come in and get debriefed, which can take hours, I decided I'd go down and grab him first and get the story. So I'm in the, go down to the garage. It's a major headquarters with an elevator that takes you down to the underground parking. And I get there just as the car pulls in and that conversation takes place. So I've heard a guy say he murdered somebody. Right. I call it in. I'm new. I'm new. Only a couple of months, four months into the business. And the editor says, what? Well, say, you forget it. I said, what do you mean forget it? I heard him say it. It's your word against the cops, he said. <laughs> and the message was, you won't be able to stay there if you do this. Right. So I waited a couple of days and I went, there was a coroner office and I went over and I took a look at the, the report and there were three bullets in the back. So now I had something, I had his name, I, had, I, I, know the, I knew the name of the cop, I knew what he'd done, and I have a report that shows the guy was shot in the back, which doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't running away, but anyway. And again, the message was, um, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? We're not doing this story. And I was scheduled to go into the Army. Um, I was only 22 or so, and you had to go in. It was compulsory then. And they knew it, and they said, you know, and so I left. And as I wrote, I said, I realized that this new, this, this profession that I, I was smitten. I love the, uh, the pace and the energy and the freedom and the sense that you were on your own and you could do things. Uh, also, I realized how much self-censorship yeah. there was in it and that I was part of it. Yeah, and we all were. Uh, we, all, we all have those stories. I mean, you have various incidents in the book. Um, there, as you write towards the end of the book, there were even things you knew about the Eli massacre, as you said, I can't write about and can't even speak about. What happened with the massacre is uh, I, I have this great notion that you have to read before you write, right? And so I was a reader, and by I go on, I come out of the Army, I work on a little newspaper, a suburban newspaper, I get hired by United Press. I got a little career going. Um, and I um, cover a legislature in South Dakota, which is a very American experience, being in South Dakota anyway. My car was snowed in in October and I got it out in April. Right. You know, I mean, we had different weather then, <laughs> like the world does. And um, I finally got a job with AP. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm working my, and I get assigned to the Pentagon. Finally, I get sent to Washington. I'm good. The AP was great. They let me, in Chicago, I spent the last year just finding a story. My job was just to come up with a story. I owned the city, I thought, you know, how it is, kids. I get to Washington, they assign me to the Pentagon, and I immediately discover, hey, McNamara is a psychotic liar, right. and he's asking the press corps to help him. And the press corps does. Well, we go up to meetings, and I'm the representing the AP, so you know I'm I'm there when he when he wants to have something written that to get himself off the snide about some story about some disaster in Vietnam, he would bring up the four or five major papers, and he or Cy Vance, the deputy secretary of defense then, and they would say, well, let's figure out we want to you know this is clearly a communist propaganda, but we don't want to be quoted saying, what, what do you think? Uh, government officials, how should we do it? And guys would say, well, let's just say government. I'm, I'm listening to this right, stuff. Right, well, right. You, know, am I, you know, am I working for the, the, the I'm working for the press in Cuba? <laughs> well, what, what, let me just interject, because throughout this book, it's not just that you're battling government power, you, and you knew I of Stone, but who said famously, all governments lie, which is correct. 
but you're often battling these courtiers within these press organizations who, who and, and Kissinger, you know, he had most of the Washington press eating out of his hand. In fact, there's a moment in the book where you're sitting across from Bernie Wurtzman, a New York Times reporter. He's essentially taking dictation from Kissinger to put in the paper, and you ask whether it's been checked. And his answer is, well, then Henry wouldn't speak to us. What it, what it was is I was new to the Times, and I got assigned to the, to a, the foreign, in the Washington Bureau, to the foreign desk section, and I sat across from him. I didn't know him. And he seemed a very jolly, pleasant he guy. He was a nice guy. A very nice guy. And, and um, uh, every day about 5 o'clock, the secretary to the bureau chief would come out and say, um, his name was Max Frankel. Who, who was a tennis partner of Kissinger. Oh, I didn't know that. I just oh, yeah, they I, played tennis. I, I just know that. But, you know, that was the job in the New York Times. You had a co right. The bureau chief's job was to cozy up to the right. president and right. people like that and get access. That was the job. I mean, right. that's the way I saw it. And I'd been sent by the executive editor, Abe Rosenthal, to Washington. I was actually working. I'm, I'm ahead, of, ahead of my chronology. Yeah, yeah. But, but I ended up, after I did the Milai story, um, working for nobody would hire me because I'd worked for uh, a, a man running for president against Lyndon Johnson. Well, that's also great, Eugene McCarthy. Yeah, and he was a liberal oh, Democrat. Uh, right. You, you know were the speechwriter. Is that was your? I job? did speech. No, I was a press guy, and I also guy, I also right. wrote speeches right, because right. nobody was doing it. There, right, they right. had some good. We picked up. We got it going. The the point is, and the papers then when I went. I won Pulitzers, I won five, six prizes, and, you know, uh, uh, to the credit of America for, for, you know, pissing on a president. Right. Um, Nixon with, with the Milai story. But newspapers wouldn't hire me because I, w I was a Democrat, clearly against the war. And the idea was I had was, um, hold on here a second. I had covered the Pentagon. I'd gotten to know officers who told me it was mass murder. I had read the Bertrand Russell Tribunal, which has a section on, me, on Vietnam that's devastating, and everybody in America sort of trashed it. I'd read the very, a bunch of Christian um, uh, groups had put out volumes uh, collecting all of the anecdotal stuff that suggested the war was a mass murder place, which it was. So I came out n thinking not because I'm a, a commie lefty symptom, symptom, but basically because any objective assessment about the war is we're in trouble. The faster we get out of there, we're murdering people. So, but anyway, I couldn't get a job. And I finally get hired by Rosenthal to go, sh basically the message is the Washington Bureau is too cozy and go write about Vietnam. And so I do, and, and I'm sitting there next to Gwertzman, my third or fourth day back in Washington, and at 5 o'clock, Max Frankel would finished, the secretary would say, her name was Barbara Gamariki, and I remember she would say, Max is done with Henry now, and he's going to turn, we're, right. we're coming to you. And then Bernie would start take writing, notes. A, take off avidly, smiling and laughing, ha, 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 yeah, laughing, yeah. saying very little. And then he would write a story that would, the, the four days, the first four days I was there in the bureau, the next day's paper was the lead story was uh, senior American officials said today that North Vietnam's view right. on this and that. And I just, when I was hired, the first thing I, since I was seen as the commie reporter, I was hired May 1, that, that same day I was sent to Paris to go see Madame Bin. Or we're going to come back to that. Go ahead. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with investigative journalist Cy Hirsch. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about American journalism with Cy Hirsch and his new book, Reporter, a Memoir. Um, so we were talking about Kissinger. It leads the paper. But this is its an important point, because real reporters like you uh, are, are not only fighting uh, powerful institutions out of the government. I want to talk a little bit about Gulf and Western. It's an important point in your book. But also the institutions they work for. Uh, you bet. <laughs> I, I didn't. What, what Gwersman told me when when I asked him about, he's 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 parodying the Times is parodying what Kissinger says. I said I asked him. I said, do you ever talk? To, I knew Mel Laird, who the former Wisconsin congressman who had been Secretary of Defense, who was a decent man in yeah. a bad place. And I said, do you let ever me just interrupt because and you make that point, and it is an important point that a lot of people on the left don't get. But that is, there are people of integrity and moral courage who exist within these institutions, the intelligence agencies, the military. They're there. You know them. I know them. And we wouldn't be able to do our work without them. 
It's a simple thing. They take the oath of office to the Constitution, not to the president, not oh. to the general that's in charge of them, not to their boss, but to the and they really take that seriously. There's a lot of them around, and, and they pay for it if they're caught. I mean, <laughs> you know, they. And they, you you have some moments, and they'll also, you know, when public officials get called out, uh, they will scapegoat. There's that general in there who takes the fall. Lavelle. For, yeah. Yes, the general. He 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 was. He ends up taking the fall for something he was ordered to do. Absolutely, he took it for Kissinger and for Nixon, and the, uh, and John. His name was John Lavelle, and I. Anyway, what's another yeah. story? I just want to tell you what. I know we just throw and you write in there Kissinger who who lies like he breathes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, that's easy. <laughs> but go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, to get back to the Bernie Gortzman, right. in, 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 he's just reflecting what his job is. I, I remember saying to him, did you ever talk to Mel Laird, the yeah. Secretary of Defense of Rogers, after Kissinger tells you something? And he said something that, that stuck with me. He said, if I did, Kissinger wouldn't talk to that's us. Right. Let, let me ask about Gulf and Western. It's a ah. small point in the book, but it's important. Because you take on public power. Uh, the CIA, and you exposed the CIA was carrying out, well, you exposed the CIA uh, spying on domestic uh, dissidents, anti-war uh, activists. Um, you uh, exposed uh, a lot of the CIA interference in overthrowing Salvador Allende. Um, the Pentagon, of course, with Milai, and there's lots of other stuff you did. But then you could come to New York and you take on Gulf and Western, Charlie Bluthorn, Mobbed up corporation, and you you write in the book there is a difference in American journalism when you take on private power. Can I just read a passage you wrote? Sure. You you go after Gulf and Western. Right. They 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 lawyer up your story and uh, make it almost unreadable. Uh, you quote again Bill Kovach, who I admire. I'm sure you do. Uh, that had, he says, had the story been about a public institution, it would have been in the paper the first time he wrote it, the first way he wrote it. He's talking about you. And then you write how the experience was frustrating uh, and how it had sapped your energy. And you say, there would be no check on corporate America, I feared. Greed had won out. The ugly fight with Gulf and Western had rattled the publisher and the editors to the point that the editors who ran the business pages had been allowed to vitiate and undercut the good work Jeff, you're talking about Jeff Gerth and I had done. Well, it was an amazing experience because... But it's worse now, isn't it? It's certainly I, I, not better. Oh, I think that, I think corporate, are you kidding? Are you kidding? I, I still want to see, I want somebody to tell, tell the American people how much money um, corporate America is making uh, with the new tax legislation. Yeah. Warren Buffett said the other day, the milk multi-billion, he saved $574 million last year in the tax bill. I don't think the American people really quite get it, how he's rammed it right up there, yeah. this yeah. new bill. I don't think they get it. And um, uh, I, I think the whole way the government's responding to, uh, to this new government. Anyway, look, the bottom line is, um, I, I left the paper over this stuff because uh, Corporate America was a great story, and they, they were. Don't touch it. What, what, what I, here's what happened. I'm well, you go after the business section. Oh, the business section. It was called Biz Day, and my, my, my colleague Jeff Gerth and I always called it Biz Millennium. <laughs> <laughs> it was simply the worst business section. They had some bright people there, for sure, but the editors were so, so toadies, so toadies to Abe. And, and um, what happened is, I, I'm minding my business, and writing my memoir. One of the things about a memoir, I, I had done, I, had, I, I published this memoir with Knopf, which was a wonderful old house, and I had had a contract with them for a book on Cheney, about whom I'd written quite a bit for The New Yorker, all during the, the Nixon, Nixon uh, uh, Cheney years, from 9-11 from on. I wrote a lot of stuff about Cheney. I obviously had some access. Which, well, you, which you, you, finally couldn't, you finally couldn't publish. I mean, you, you said you had to put the book on hold. Uh, well, what happened, the stuff I published for The New Yorker was just a fragment of what I was learning. But you said the intelligence, the... the what, hap what happened is, is that I was then going to write a book uh, after about 2010, Obama was in, and I was, I was then going to let it all out. I mean, what I really, there was other stuff I knew that, it was a source issue. But it turned out a lot of the people who were working for Cheney were professionals and stayed in. Uh, in various jobs, and so when I started turning in chapters, and what I did because of the sensitivity of some of the stuff the, these guys were into, 
I would let them read chapters or at least the parts of the chapter that, that reflected their information. And they all said, are you kidding? Obama people, you don't realize Obama was very tough on secrecy. And they were, there were people he prosecuted publicly. Well, he for used the, the Espionage Act, what is it, eight or nine times to go after uh, There were some people that were prosecuted with no, no publicity. Oh. Really amazing. Not because of the Espionage they just did it quietly. Some awful stuff. Anyway, um, somebody in, in, the, in the National Security Council was driven out and put, put in jail for, anyway, it's, it's just, so by 2015, 16, I had the book, chunks of the book done. I began to give it to people to read. I just do that. You know, I never wrote a story about somebody going after somebody without letting them know the night before that it's going to be bad. And I always found that helped because it just takes the edge off. I mean, they, 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 could, they could figure out I'm just doing my job. That's, you know, that's all I'm doing. I wasn't out to get them personally. And anyway, what happened is um, uh, 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 because of the stuff, the secrecy of some of the stuff that was involved and the fact that Cheney was... He had foreign bank accounts, and you know there's a, there was a joke going around that when it came to torture, there were legal opinions written me that undercut the Constitution, which the White House saw as a nuisance. Well, this notion of the Constitution being a nuisance was much more widespread. There was much more they com a complete. I mean, a lot of secret stuff was done with no Congress money, no money authorized to pay, and there were private funds. There were funds kept, and I knew a lot about it. I just, and the guys, I just couldn't write about it without getting people in trouble. That's how this book came about. I told my publisher, I said, I don't, I think I can't do this book because I, my loyalty is to people that talk to me. But let me, let me ask about, and you begin the book by talking about how you, I think both of us worked in what you call the golden age of journalism, which is true. We had resources that journalists don't have, reporters don't have anymore. And, and what do you, how do you look at the landscape? What's happened to journalism in the United States? Well, you have, the, I think, the most odious thing is cable television. I, I know this. And what happens is cable television, um, it's 24 hours a day, a constant need for breaking news. I mean, which is often it's, you can pair it, you can pair it, you can do parodies about it all week, but at a certain point, it doesn't matter. People, and so here's a president who um, lies in the strangest way, he'll have a 20-minute interview, and at the end of it, you'll say, as you said, so I didn't say that. Right. He just said it 20 minutes earlier. Uh, I'm not going to diminish what he does, but I just remember in 1965, Lyndon Johnson told the American people for six months we're not going to war in South Asia, and he already had troops there. I mean, there's a lie. But I'm not that you can't diminish what this man does, because he, do, but he does it right in front of you, the president. And so what cable news does is, uh, you have a president that can't tell the truth, and yet all you have to do is be somebody in the White House, call up cable news and say, uh, we're going to bomb so-and-so today because of so-and-so, bulletin. It's all, all of a sudden, it depends on what it, if it's about the people we hate, uh, uh, Assad, you can say anything you want about Assad, and there's no questioning about it. There's a man that truth is not really on his radar, as his information, he's very second-hand on it. I mean, there's just no question. He doesn't read, and he doesn't, he's got his idea fix A's. We see it all the day. And so cable news is, the way it works is uh, you get a tip about something. Wow. You immediately uh, put it on your newspaper's web page. But, but it boils down to, there's no, they don't report. No, no. There's no report. But they don't check. And they don't check. They right? don't verify. They're fed. They're fed. And it gets to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then you have panels. Yeah. Then they have panels, and the panels are all set up. And you watch these panels, and they, there's a question raised by the moderator. And um, the first two words are the most hor I write about the right. worst words. I think. Of, <laughs> I think. I think. I'm not interested in what some guy thinks. I want to know what he knows. Right. I, I was on TV with one person about the book, unlike you. Um, and we asked, he asked a few questions about Trump. I have a, uh, I, I actually said yesterday somewhere uh, early in the day he was going to change his mind about because he's getting beat up. He has no views on it. You know about immigration. Yeah, he has no views. He right, doesn't right. understand. Right. He doesn't have any views. Right. He doesn't know. He's got Miller, people conservatives right. say you've got to stop it. Oh, it plays good to his base. It still does. But he did change because he wants to run for president. And as long as the papers take, are dealing with his tweets, and he wins. Yeah. yeah because, anyway, but the point is, this one, <laughs> one TV person, after asking me about, about, about uh, I was there to talk about 
my, my book. And here you are, I'm looking at how, how hard you worked. This one anchor person said to me, we asked the question to do about Trump, and he said, now he said, tell me about the book. Right. Which, what? <laughs> so, I, not, where's, only, where's not, not only had not even seen the book, right. nobody even got a producer. Right. I almost said, I almost said, well, it's got 36 pages of pictures <laughs> and a lot of words. Right. I, I started to say that. I said, you can't say that. So I mumbled something and got out of it. But I mean, that, that's where you're at. We got so to stop. stop there. OK, OK. Right, thanks, Cy. That was journalist Cy Hirsch, author of Reporter a Memoir. We're nice. done. We're done. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> One night, about 3 o'clock, this cop calls in and says, uh, I've got a fugitive that tried to flee, and I, uh, I had to take, you know, he's dead. I had to shoot him. And so instead of waiting for him to come in and get debriefed, which can take hours, I decided I'd go down and grab him first and get the story. So I'm in the go down to the garage. It's a major headquarters with an elevator. It takes you down to the underground parking. And I get there just as the car pulls in and that conversation takes place. So I've heard a guy say he murdered somebody. Right. I call it in. I'm new. I'm new. Only a couple of months, four months into the business. And the editor says, what? I say, you forget it. I said, what do you mean forget it? I heard him say it. It's your word against the cops, he said. <laughs> and the message was, you won't be able to stay there if you do this. Right. So I waited a couple of days, and I went. There was a coroner office, and I went over, and I took a look at the, the report, and there were three bullets in the back. So now I had something. I had his name. I, had, I, I, know the, I knew the name of the cop. I knew what he'd done. And I have a report that shows the guy was shot in the back, which doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't running away. But anyway, and again, the message was, um, are you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? We're not doing this story. And I was scheduled to go into the Army. Um, I was only 22 or so. And you had to go in. It was compulsory then. And they knew it. And they said, you know. And so I left. And as I wrote, I said, I realized that this new, this this profession that I, I was smitten. I love the, uh, the pace and the energy and the freedom and the sense that you were on. Stop. By our daily newspapers, our televisions, our online news agencies, our social media, and our president. Joining me in the studio to discuss his new book, Reporter, a Memoir and the State of American Journalism, is Cy Hirsch. I love the book. <laughs> I'm a report. You know, I worked some of the places you did. I, I devoured this thing in one day. Um, but I want to begin because throughout the book, there's, I find it very poignant, and it's something we've all done as reporters. It's what we can't tell. Um, and um, you, you begin very early, you're covering uh, Chicago police. And you write, the driver, white, beefy, and very Irish, like far too many Chicago cops then, obviously did not see me as he parked the car. As he climbed out, a fellow cop who clearly had heard the same radio report I had shouted something, so the guy tried to run on you, the driver said, no, nah, I told to beat it and then plugged him. We shot him dead. But that didn't get in your story. <sighs> and, and, and there are moments like that. We've all had it. Um, and, and you put it in the book. I mean, you're quite open about this form of self-censorship. But let's begin with that. Uh, I was covering, I'm a kid. I, um, uh, I grew up in, in, I was an immigrant. Um, which apparently isn't such a good thing to be these days no. in this country. But anyway, my parents both came over from Eastern Europe. Uh, I had a father that didn't talk and a mother that communicated by cooking. So, uh, you know, I was on my own. Uh, although they were perfectly, you know, they were perfectly, they took care of me and my, my, my siblings. Uh, Can so, I just interject that you worked your way through the University of Chicago running your father's cleaning? My father store. died, got right. cancer when I was 15, and I took over because I was, I had a brother, but he was always more ethereal. and. Um, uh, I was the one who could cope, so, uh, or at least it was seemed that way. And so I ran it, and um, uh, I got to the University of Chicago by hook and crook and had a good education, but um, never was free, really, of the family constraints until um, I graduated from college when my brother, my twin brother, uh, took my mother. I, I took care of her for five years, took my mother to California with him. He, he got married. And I was suddenly free, free of the, of the burden of opening up a store. It was in the black ghetto of Chicago. I learned an awful lot about racism just by being part of it and uh, seeing it firsthand. I, you know, my, the people that worked for us um, would talk about uh, the constrained future they had. Anyway, 
Um, I go to law school, I hate law school, I drop out. I'm still free. I mean, I'm paying 12 bucks a week for a basement room, and I've never felt so happy. I'm reading all the stuff that I could do. And um, I drop out, and I'm selling booze. And one day, um, in a bar, somebody who's just going to work for Time Magazine told me about a place called City News Bureau. It's a police agency. Chicago had so much crime and uh, so much court action since the John Dillinger Jays of, you know, of street crime in, in Chicago, the massacres, St. Valentine's, famous massacres of, the, of organized crime. So the four papers got together in the 1920s and set up a news agency that, whose function would be to cover the courts and the police station. So I went there as a copy boy. I got a job by sheer luck. You just had to go on a, uh, you had to have a BA. <laughs> and they just went through, anyway, I got there. I run a copy machine. Um, I get sent finally to be a reporter on the street. I get a sense of it by running, being a copy boy. I get a sense of what it's like. But within months, I'm covering downtown Chicago police. I'm the midnight. They called it the lobster ship shift. And I'm, I'm only three reporters, somebody from the Chicago Tribune, and I'm there representing the other papers and the, new, and the radio stations. And most nights from midnight to eight, Nothing happens, and the cops, you know, cops are pretty friendly guys. They come back, and if they make a big bust with some marijuana, we smoke it with them, or watch a dirty movie with them, and stuff like that. This is 1960. <laughs> and um, uh, I learned a lot about the police. I learned a lot about tyranny, because the one thing you could do as a reporter in Chicago, as a police reporter, is the cops will be real good to you if you don't do two things, mess around with their corruption or the mob. They protected the mob. I'm exaggerating slightly, but you'd have a situation where some guy in, in, in the, there's a, a, a street of sin that the mob controlled, you know, brothels and stuff like that. If some guy showed up and, on the street with 14 bullet holes in it and it was reported as a victim of a traffic accident, you didn't mess with that. Right. But other than that, you own the city. <laughs> and so Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the state of American journalism with investigative reporter Cy Hirsch. I still want to see, I want somebody to tell, tell the American people how much money um, corporate America is making um, with the new tax legislation. Well, Warren Buffett said the other day, the milk multi-billionaire, he saved $574 million last year in the tax bill. I don't think the American people really quite get it, how he's rammed it right up then, this new bill. Seymour Hirsch is perhaps the nation's greatest investigative reporter. He has since winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1970 for his uncovering of the slaughter by U.S. troops of more than 500 Vietnamese civilians in the village of My Lai on March 16, 1968. Gone on to break one seismic story after another. He exposed the Nixon administration's secret bombing of Cambodia, the CIA's domestic spying operation against anti-war activists and its role in the overthrow in 1973 of the Chilean government of Salvador Allende. More recently, he broke the story about the torture of prisoners by U.S. soldiers in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq and exposed the fictitious narrative the Obama administration spun around the killing of Osama bin Laden. Is this era of great journalism, which he embodies, however gone, in an age when, as he writes, we are sodden with fake news, hyped up and incomplete information and false assertions delivered non -stop.